Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It is uh, noon Eastern time on Monday, June 22nd. Uh, thank you for coming to us through this for the first in a series that we put together at the uh, Yale uh, Information Society project on everything you need to know about Section 230 in five hours. Um, I have been fact-checked on this uh, on this notion uh, in the pre-game pre show uh, by, by a child uh, <laughs> via his father. <laughs> and uh, yes, it is in fact true. It is not five hours. It is seven and a half hours. I will put a label on this, uh, on this thing and a notification so that people know that this is in fact potentially misleading information. But the general conceit is hopefully that in like five or seven and a half hours, we can cover some major ground on all of the different perspectives of 2.30. Um, and I kind of, the idea of this uh, webinar series and the reason I thought I really kind of was looking forward to doing it, um, in particular doing it with the people who um, are invited for this week's panels, is because I've been on various panels with all of them to talk about 230 or seen them talk about 230 or read their scholarship on Section 230. And they all have incredibly different and valuable perspectives. And what I feel like happens in a lot of the meetings and panels that we do is that everyone has a chance to kind of give their perspective on what 230 means and what it means for the future and how X bill or X amendment or X court case will change its interpretation. And I really just thought that it, it, and there's just many, many different perspectives and they never get to be fully heard or fully fleshed out because there's just so little time in an hour or 90 minutes. And so the goal of this series is basically um, exactly as it says in the program. We're gonna start with the history of Section 230. Um, and we probably pretty much have like, I think the best legal scholars um, that are uh, speaking about this today and here to talk about it with us. Uh, and then we are gonna go um, next week to talking about really what this means for telecom law and uh, potentially for agencies and talk a little bit about the executive order uh, that came down um, a couple of uh, weeks ago from President Trump. And then the third part third on Wednesday is going to be talking to people who implemented policies that were made possible in uh, the space that 230 created at the for the platforms. Um, so talking to people that were uh, foundational at Google, Facebook, Twitter, and Yahoo, all of whom kind of have bring a really unique perspective about how to implement certain types of content moderation policies at scale, and then uh, at the at the the fourth day on Thursday, we're going to talk really about why Section 230 is coming up in the news so much, why Jeff has to do 13 calls with reporters every other day, <laughs> and kind of uh, to talk about what's going on, why it matters now, uh, who it matters to, um, and wh who the, like, the relevant parties are. And then the final day, um, we're really going to devote to almost kind of, a, I think it's going to be actually maybe fun, but a little depressing, kind of fantastical, kind of like really imagining and uh, talking about what the world will look like without Section 230, um, if, it, if that is what in fact happens. Um, and then, uh, and talk to some people who, you know, I think have had firsthand knowledge of this through SESTA-FOSTA and what it's meant to them. And so uh, that is the week. And I think it's kind of a great range of issues. And it's going to, I hope this is going to be a webinar series that exists. Uh, it'll be hosted on the Yale ISP site and also um, on Lawfare. Uh, thank you very much for, for hosting that. It'll be closed captioned so it's accessible to everyone. And um, I just really hope it's a resource in the future for people who are making law around this, studying it, uh, or are generally interested in this topic. And now I have talked too much. Um, and so I'm going to introduce our amazing guest for today. Uh, Jeff Kosef is the author of the 26 words that created the internet, which is hint hint section 230. And uh, he is a professor at the U.S. Naval Academy. Uh, Eric Goldman is a law professor at Santa Clara University. He has run a, an incredible blog that has detailed all of the breakouts around the country and courts over the years around Section 230, the interpretations and everything. He has um, probably the most knowledge of 
anyone maybe besides Jeff or alongside Jeff about really like the legislative or excuse me, the judicial history of Section 230. And we have Marianne Franks, a professor of law at Miami University, uh, who has written extensively about kind of the world that was created under Section 230 and who was harmed by it and uh, who benefited from it and really has offered a, a incredibly valuable perspective in that that kind of contrasts to the cyber libertarianism and uh, and you know wild wild west um, stance of uh, what the internet kind of meant for everyone uh, in the early days of section 230 so thank you all for being here and uh, it's great to see your faces thanks for having us thank, thank you um, so let's get started uh, I am Really, I know that every panel starts like this, Jeff, but Jeff, <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, you wrote oh. the book on Section 230. Yep. Uh, why, don't you, why didn't you get us started, Jeff? <laughs> um, you want me to talk about how it came about? Or? Yeah, you want to talk okay. us about Oakmont, or Stratton, Oakmont, and yeah, yeah, all of the good stuff. Sure. So I, I have to start off by saying that everything I say is only on my behalf, not who do I have to say? Not the Defense Department, not the Navy, not the US Naval Academy. So uh, that said, um, so to understand Section 230, you really have to understand what protections distributors of other people's content had before uh, Section 230 and before the internet. And I won't go into, uh, I'll give a plug for my book if you wanna learn about bookstores being, uh, bookstore owners being prosecuted for selling obscene books, read the first chapter of my book. But basically the rule that emerged both from the Supreme Court, but then more importantly from lower courts was generally uh, if you're distributing someone else's content, if you're a distributor under the common law, you're only liable if you know or have reason to know of the unlawful content. So this worked, but not just for obscenity, but also for uh, defamatory material in magazines, for example. And it was fairly straightforward. There were some disputes, but uh, it, it was pretty, pretty clear cut. Uh, but then in the early 90s, as we had more commercial online services, uh, CompuServe and Prodigy, it became a little more difficult to figure out how to apply. And it really came down to these two cases. Uh, the first case involving CompuServe, which did have some editorial policies, but or some policies for user content, but it really did not have the same amount of moderation or anything like that that uh, Prodigy had for third party content. So CompuServe gets sued for a defamatory, allegedly defamatory statement in a newsletter that was distributed in one of its forums. And the court grants summary judgment to CompuServe saying, you know, you're not exercising editorial control. You're more like a newsstand than a newspaper and then applies the distributor test and says, you didn't know, you didn't have reason to know. Uh, a few years later, um, Prodigy gets sued and Prodigy is, has a different format in terms of wanting to be family friendly. So Prodigy uh, had more extensive policies and most importantly, they had these contractors that moderated uh, sites that would take take material down, report users, that sort of thing. Uh, even though they they didn't do as much of it in the mid 90s as they did in the early 90s, but they still were doing. It. Uh, they get sued uh, by an investment banker, actually uh, the person who Jonah Hill's Wolf of Wall Street character is based on, uh, for 200 million dollars for an allegedly defamatory post and a financial bulletin board, and uh, the court doesn't look at the liability or the defamation yet. The court just looks at a motion of should Prodigy be considered a distributor? And this is a New York State trial judge um, who actually had just been censured a few years before that for making racist statements to a litigant. Um, so he gets this case and he, in what I think was a really bad opinion, he said, no, Prodigy is not a distributor. Prodigy is a publisher because it exercised some editorial control. Uh, it even got to a point where uh, Prodigy issued an apology. And then the plaintiff said, OK, we're fine with making a mo motion to vacate this opinion because everyone recognized it was bad. And the judge refused to do that. Uh, this was in 1995. So Congress, uh, so, and it gets a lot of attention in the media because it's saying, hey, there's actually a disincentive to moderate content because if you moderate, then you actually could increase your liability. 
this comes right as everyone is really panic there's a lot of panic in the media about minors in schools and libraries at home being able to access pornography on the internet this is just as the internet is becoming much more widely available uh, the congress is revamping its telecom laws for the first time in 60 years and the senate is considering a law and they add it to their telecom uh, their telecom overhaul uh, they're considering something called the communications decency act which adds these criminal criminal penalties for the transmission of not just obscene, but indecent content. Um, it's pretty clear to a lot of people, including much of the House, including Speaker Gingrich, that this is unconstitutional. But um, it, the Senate attaches it to its version. In the House, this is where Section 230 comes in. Uh, Chris Cox and Ron Wyden are looking at uh, how to address this problem in a different way. They're much more concerned about not having government regulation of internet content and also not having a disincentive for moderation. So they propose the Internet Freedom and Family Empowerment Act, which becomes Section 230. Okay, um, I'm gonna pause you right there sure. for one second. I'm gonna ask, um, you've got like, so you've got Section 230, you have these two court decisions, which are creating yes. uh, up, op opposite incentives for companies, um, yeah. right? And yeah. the Communications Decency Act, one of the, the motivations for it was not just kind of was was very specifically right like the the fear of pornography uh yeah. proliferating on the internet and a particular report that came out right i'm just am i remembering yeah. that correctly yeah it, so so i mean when you look at the there's not all that much legislative history there is one day of floor debate um uh, about se what became section 230 and most of the discussion is actually about not even what Wyden and cox are proposing, but what the Senate is proposing. And they're saying this is an alternative. Uh, we want to control pornography, but we want to, it's a theory of user empowerment. We want to empower the users and the platforms to figure out what works best rather than having the government do it. So, so I, and it was, so in addition to platform moderation at the time, there were the tools just coming out, Surfwatch and NetNanny and they wanted to promote the use of those tools as well. So that was also another motivator behind Section 230. Great, and so Section 230, and to skip ahead, it passes. Yeah, yeah. so both Section 230 and the CDA, they both, even though they kind of conflict with one another, they both get added to the final version of the Telecom Act. The Supreme Court strikes down the CDA, the Senate part, as unconstitutional. So Section 230 is basically, what remains of what is now known as the Communications Decency Act. I, I even I had to write CDA in my book, but I hate even referring it to it as that because it really was not <laughs> the Communications Decency Act. And the, that terminology really um, confuses the debate because they say, oh, well, it was proposed as the Communications Decency Act. No, it was actually called the Internet Freedom and Family Empowerment Act which when you, I mean, even that alone tells you something a little different about what the motivations were. But yeah, I mean, in a short, that's a long way of saying it did come down to an approach to fighting, uh, to, to basically restricting the access to pornography for minors. There were other issues, but I mean, that was really what framed the debate at that time. Eric, do you think that there's, um, to kind of go to you, after Reno, decides that, you know, that Section 230 is going to live and go forward. What was really, how did it end up kind of uh, becoming, how did it end up being interpreted by the courts, the various provisions and what the amount of immunity that it granted to, to, um, to platforms from liability? Uh, Jeff described well how um, the part that, that we're focused on, Section 230, didn't get a lot of love during the legislative debates and uh, development. So um, in February 1996, Congress dumps this huge law onto the American public. Um, and then there's this really high profile portion, the CDA portion, the Senate portion as Jeff described. Um, and then there was this other corner that was tucked in there. And I think that the practitioners at the time were really quite sure what it meant. Um, uh, we, we could read the words obviously, but did it really say what it meant? It was uh, it was just a little bit unclear how broadly the courts would interpret it. Um, now, uh, it was clear that at the time, one of the key lobbyists in favor of the uh, Section 230 provisions was AOL. So AOL knew what it had acquired. Um, and it's not an accident then that AOL was the leading 
first defendant to invoke Section 230 because they had they had uh, spec'd it out to be a resource for them. And so really the action uh, in Section 230 heated up when we got the Zarin case, starting with the district court case uh, shortly after its passage and then uh, with the 1997 appellate case. Um, I think that's when people really started to realize what the law could mean and how broadly it could apply. I think before that, we weren't just quite sure um, that it meant what it said. Um, but after Zarin case, that's really the, the uh, turbocharging of the law. It, the law itself was pretty powerful, and then the Zarin reading really exacerbated every uh, um, potential interpretation of it to, to streamline and say, this is a really broad, powerful law. And that's what I think led to the, uh, uh, the, the long shadow it's cast. Yeah, and how, I mean, and it basically, after Zarin, it got, it was, that went, you know, that was basically the interpretation that was adopted by most courts as they encountered these issues. Did it, did it, it but it, it has also been, there's been many courts that have kind of uh, stretched it even a little bit, be, I think, a little bit beyond Zarin or other types of things. And, um, you know, for example, roommates.com, and there have been some other uh, types of uh, cases that have not just looked specifically at kind of traditional speech platform type behavior, but uh, other types of use of platforms um, that are, you know, different than the, you know, the bulletin boards that were initially imagined for it. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, so at its core, Section 230 says websites aren't liable for third party content. And one of the things that catches people by surprise sometimes. It says that it doesn't really matter if the website tried to do the kind of moderation efforts like Prodigy did, or if they don't try to do any moderation efforts or, or take minimal moderation efforts like CompuServe did. All of those decisions are, um, uh, are equally covered under Section 230. And so Section 230 really says, you can try and fail and not be liable for whatever you miss. Um, and that strikes a lot of people as counterintuitive. That's not the way we learned it in first year law school. Like Jeff had explained, before Section 230, the rule was, if you had editorial control, you would assume whatever liability um, applied to you. And if you didn't have editorial control, then you might have some basis on which to escape liability. Section 230 says you can have editorial control and escape liability as if you did it. Um, so throughout a Section 230's history, we've had judges, especially those trained in very classical common law thinking, uh, just like they would teach it in a 1L class, say, I don't understand this. This doesn't make sense. Why would Congress do that? So we've seen over the years a number of exceptions where uh, a number of cases where judges have tried to push against Section 230 because it just doesn't strike them as right. It's not the way that they understand the common law and the, the overall scheme of liability allocations. Roommates.com is one example of that, where really at its core, especially in the first Ninth Circuit ruling, the, the, the two judges voting uh, uh, um, to circumscribe Section 230 make clear they didn't understand its exceptionalism. Why would Congress do this? Why does that even make sense? Um, and uh, as a result, then they tried to figure out a way to get around uh, the, the provisions, especially as interpreted by Zarin. Um, and we have a number of other cases. I'll point to one just a couple of years ago, the Daniel versus Armsless case, where a judge uh, in Wisconsin took a very, very narrow interpretation of Section 230 that was in conflict with hundreds of prior rulings. But the judge just looked at it and says, when I bring my fresh eyes to this, I don't see what everyone else has seen. And that's not been uncommon throughout its history. But I think the real friction point is because Section 230 is counterintuitive. It says, that you can, you can exercise control and not be liable. And I think at the core, there's just some people who can't accept that, that type of deal. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I do think that there is this weird, um, almost uh, by framing it almost in the negative, like that there is, uh, that it kind of trips people up. And I think that there are some, some basic uh, misunderstanding. I find Section 230 is best understood if you think about the way, what it was supposed to instr instrumentalize and the ends that it was supposed to kind of reach, which is why I kind of think that, which is why the history that Jeff kind of described is, um, is so important, but that is not actually, that is a, I think that the, what the judge's reaction to a lot, to 
to seeing kind of and digging into Section 230 for perhaps the first time when it ends up in their court is this interesting uh, point that you said, Eric. Thank you. So, Marianne, um, there's this very famous John Perry Barlow quote um, that, you know, all of us kind of know we have no elected government. We are likely to, we, nor are we likely to have one. So I address you with no greater authority than that which liberty itself always speaks. I declare the global social space we are building to be naturally independent of the tyrannies you seek to impose on us. You have no more, you have no moral right to rule us, nor do you possess any methods of enforcement. We have true reason to fear. Um, I teach your writing uh, against Barlow. And I want to say that my students have universally in every class come out saying that they agree with your interpretation of the internet. Um, and they think that the declaration of the of independence from cyberspace uh, by Barlow is um, becoming the way of the dinosaurs uh, or going the way of the dinosaurs. Um, and I'm very curious, tell us kind of, uh, tell us what your formulation is, which I think is a very compelling counterpoint to Barlow. Great, so I think it's a great starting point, the declaration, because it, of course it happens in the same year that um, the CDA 230 is um, passed. And so we're talking about exactly the same time period where John Perry Barlow is looking at the attempt by Congress to regulate the internet and is saying, you can't do that because you have no authority here. And it's even it's it's a bit hard to even know where to start with that. I mean, start with just the the kind of the arrogance of the of the title, right? The Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace, written by who exactly, right? By someone who has taken it upon himself to speak on behalf of the citizens of cyberspace, whatever that means. And it's extremely telling that it is written. It is meant to invoke something like the Declaration of Independence, um, which immediately I think should call into question what is it that Barlow and people like Barlow thought that they were having to throw off. Uh, what was the persecution and the oppression that they were having to experience that we needed to colonize a new area um, to say we've got to be free, right? Um, John Perry Barlow was white and male, and so were most of the people that were part of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which he helped to found. And just this extraordinary moment where you're declaring freedom from something without even acknowledging what some of the actual existing um, real prejudices and oppression that actually exist might be. So there's absolutely no mention in Barlow's declaration of um, gender bias, for instance. He makes reference to race and social status and military status, but no reference to, um, to, to the kinds of um, different forms of misogyny that have obviously, I think obviously, have kept women from being able to freely express themselves um, since basically we ever had a concept of freedom of expression. So the great irony is that his declaration sounds a lot like the Declaration of Independence in the fact that it's throwing off the yoke of tyranny um, for a select group of people without really so much as even considering what actual vulnerable groups have experienced. And that is written throughout his document, but it's also echoed in Section 230 itself, because as important as what the court was think um, the Congress was thinking about is what it wasn't thinking about. If we think of 1996 as being it's porn or not porn, that's a really limited way of looking at what some of the issues already were in 1996. We already knew that the um, Aryan Liberty Net, a white supremacist group, was uh, mobilizing to say, we know that the internet's going to be the greatest thing for white supremacy there ever has been. We already know that there were people who were using Usenet and other types of forums to um, depict incredibly violent graphic threats against their female classmates, right? We knew all that was happening in the 1990s, 1980s as well. So for the conversation to have been about, well, we're really worried about whether or not someone will get sued for defamation because we're not sure if the internet forums are a publisher or something else, that's an incredibly limited way of looking at the potential dangers as well as the potential um, uh, you know, benefits of what the internet was supposed to bring. So I think that's as important um, a story as it is to say this is what Congress was worried about. So Congress clearly wasn't thinking about the fact that if the Section 230 um, idealism and the internet idealism generally and Barlow's enthusiasm, which I think is one of the great historical documents for showing what that mindset was, if it was about freedom of expression, if it was about throwing off the yoke of tyranny, getting away from the discrimination of our bodies, then the fact that it has no consciousness of what actual racial prejudice looks like or what actual misogynist prejudice looks like or prejudice against any of these groups looks like and takes no account of it, 
um, is very telling. And so when we look at Section 230, we can read into it all the tea leaves we want, but we have to really understand that this was a deliberate, um, either deliberate or um, I think inexcusably sort of ignorant way of approaching the concerns about how to deal with liability on the internet. And that's, you know, all throughout the actual text of Section 230 itself. Look at the words it uses, publishers or speakers of information. It was written from the mindset of defamation cases and obscenity cases. And maybe that made sense in the early 1990s because the internet hadn't had images for all that long and commercial activity had only been um, sort of in the last couple of years had really flourished online. But this is the, the biggest problem in some ways with Section 230 is that it's written as though everything that happens online is speech and everything is protected speech. And therefore Section 230 is this kind of extra safeguard of speech for online. And that just completely ignores all the other types of things that might happen online and ignores the fact that freedom of speech has never actually been free for all people. So I think when we look at Section 230, we do need to see as much as what the, the law was concerned with and the language it was using, we need to really be critical about the fact that it ignored so many things and spoke in this really bizarre specific language about one particular type of speech tort, essentially, as opposed to thinking broadly about all the ways in which the internet was going to exacerbate already existing prejudices against vulnerable groups. Yeah, really well said as always. And I think that like, I think that what's interesting here too, by the way, Marianne, is that you might be like against Section 230 or kind of how it's been construed. And Barlow is against Section 230, but from two per completely different perspectives and worldviews. And I think that that's actually an interesting kind of, um, that's, a, that's a historical dichotomy that you see play, playing out today um, over and over again. And I, I kind of, I, I want to ask one more, ask you one more question, which is this, this idea that, um, that the, the limits of limiting, the, how am I going to phrase this? Section 230 basis in kind of defamation law and uh, that erroneous kind of, that erroneous kind of setting, what would you have chosen instead? If you could go back in time, what do you think would have been a better standard or no standard at all? Well, I think those two things are really connected, right? So to the extent that Barlow is making this bizarre claim, and we really do need to reflect on how bizarre it is, that the, um, the declaration says, no governments can touch us, no law exists here. And this is the man who founded the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which bases almost all of its platform on Section 230 and on the First Amendment. In other words, completely dependent on a notion of law from a very specific country with a very specific history. So on the first hand, it's completely unintelligible, right? This idea of I'm throwing off the yoke of law, except for when I like it, um, but I'm not even gonna admit that when I like it, that it actually is law and it is regulation. Section 230 is a regulation after all. Um, I don't know if you can still hear me because I'm getting a, okay. All right, so can you still hear me? Okay, so that's in itself interesting, this kind of we're not doing law, we're not doing regulation in this very selective sense, right? Because of course, that's what John Perry Barlow and the Electronic Frontier Foundation cares about. Um, so we need to think about how, why that was the ideological stance of pretending as though we're the rebels here and we're doing something completely outside of the law when in fact everything about the internet and internet freedom has now become a Section 230 fight. All right, with that being said, I think it's, it's, it's actually kind of interesting for me because I have until very recently not been a person who thought that Section 230 should be reformed or repealed. Um, I've actually thought that courts were just misinterpreting it. I think they've actually misinterpreted it completely um, in a way that I think could, be, could have been corrected if we weren't on this path for so long already. That is, when you use words like publisher and speaker, they should mean something, right? They should mean something and you can't make them mean something else. If it's not speech, if we're not talking about actual speech, then I don't think any of that stuff applies. Now, Section 230 could have been more careful to point that out, that to say, finish the loop, right? Publisher or speaker, and it shouldn't have said information provided by someone else, it should have said speech. And it should have made clear that this is only limited to speech claims. And that would have actually given us a moment to talk in an intelligent way, in a sophisticated way about how much of the activity online is actually speech. Some of that, those questions are actually really hard. Um, Eric already mentioned the arms list case. That's one of those, right? This is an online um, firearms marketplace that is able to take protections of what is usually bandied about as a speech protective law. So that seems completely bizarre. 
And the reason why some courts resist it and say that can't be right is because there's at least one really good argument for saying that's not what Section 230 says. It's dealing with, at least by implication, speech. And if something isn't speech, then we don't have to treat it like speech. And then there's the other confusing part where we haven't talked about yet, which is the Good Samaritan language that's thrown in there. Um, if, the, if Congress is going to name things, right, like Good Samaritan, then we need to ask ourselves, what did it mean by that? And in the offline context, Good Samaritan laws are pretty clear. They presume, first of all, that a person doesn't have a duty of care. They presume that someone doesn't have a duty of care and nonetheless attempts to do a good thing, they should get immunity for that reason. Um, it wouldn't make any sense in the offline context to say, I'm going to give you immunity for something you didn't do. Um, and it definitely doesn't make sense to say, I'm going to give you immunity for um, actually contributing to the harm that you um, that has been created here. So again, the presumptions here is that law just got completely swept aside. Um, yeah. Notions of what the law should do completely gets swept aside because we're presuming, first of all, that none of these actors, whether you're Facebook or a blog or anything else, ever has any responsibility for contributing to content, um, I should back up and say, for facilitating content that causes extraordinary harm, even if they're fully aware of it, even if they're making profits from it, even if it's completely foreseeable how injurious it would be. And I don't think you have to read 230 that way. And I think it's a real shame that courts have. And now that they have, we're in this I think pretty bad position of having to say, let's go back and try to see if we can mitigate some of the extraordinary harms that that interpretation has really wrought. Yeah, that's, uh, yes, absolutely. And I'm, I wanna hear Eric's response to this. And then I also wanna hear Jeff riff about the Good Samaritan law, <laughs> like, the Good Samaritan language, sorry. Um, but I just wanna quickly tell people we're at 30 minutes. Um, we are going to take questions depending on how the talk is going at starting at 12.45 or one. And um, please, we will not be answering anything that's put in chat. I just can't keep up with it because it's just me and there's 150 of you. Um, so please put your question to the Q&A and we will kind of exercise panelists and moderator privilege in picking out ones to, um, to um, rapture into the conversation to ask your question uh, to, the, to the panel. Um, but Eric, go ahead, please. Um. There's so much to talk about with Mary Ann's remarks. Uh, I'm not even sure where to start. So I'm just going to pick off a couple of uh, pieces. Um, let me start with the speech conduct divide, um, which uh, I actually think if we were to pick our words really carefully, I think Mary and I would actually agree that if a, a site is engaging in uh, conduct of its own choosing, that it would be responsible for that conduct. Um, but that if we were talking about pure speech, whatever we might mean in that as something other than conduct, uh, we might treat it differently. Um, so unfortunately, the problem that we have um, uh, throughout the law is that the divide between speech and conduct is, is incoherent. Um, and it certainly is the case when you talk about things like publishing content, the whole idea is that it is both a speech act and a form of activity, of human activity. It's conduct. Um, so trying to move this to say, well, we could make this distinction between speech and conduct, I don't think buys us a lot. Um, I don't think it really gets us uh, where we want to go. Um, the discussions about Good Samaritan, I think, are, are really interesting um, because um, when we think about a site trying to um, facil facilitate speech, um, uh, what we want them to do is to try and not be liable for failing. We want them to, to in fact, do the, the, um, uh, the, the interventions like uh, Project was trying to do in the mid-1990s that were the basis of its liability. Um, the problem is that what it, if we uh, uh, don't calibrate that correctly, um, then we'll backdoor into the situation where anyone who tries and fails is now responsible for all the failures. And so I feel like if we're, the, that actually the Section 230 does something really subtle, but very, very powerful. It says, we're gonna just not try to draw some lines about how much you tried or how hard you tried um, because of the fact that if we try to draw that line, wherever we draw it, it's going to create this exception that's going to actually undermine the whole idea. You can try and still not be responsible for failing. Um, so I, I, I just encourage uh, um, anyone thinking about Mary Ann's remarks to think about, okay, how would we phrase that differently? And Kate, you asked that, that question. I think it's a really powerful statement. How would you phrase it differently that would still get sites to exercise some form of editorial control, whatever kind you, you, you think is appropriate, and not be liable for 
having having tried hard to to do what uh, you want them to without having to become the basis for someone to then come and say, but you didn't do it right, you didn't try hard enough. Um, and if anyone can always claim that my claim is based on you didn't do it right, you didn't try hard enough, the, the, the law doesn't actually do any good. It, it doesn't have any value because then it becomes um, uh, uh, um, easily worked around. Um, so to me, I, I really think the, the question isn't, could we have picked different words at the time? I'm sure we could have. Um, but the real question is, um, how do we get uh, the, how, if we value the, the ability for people to talk to each other using third party tools, what kind of system will enable that? Um, and my fear is any of the regulatory reforms that are being discussed today don't actually value the ability of people to talk to each other. And so to me, I think the real challenge that we face and all of us face um, is if we're gonna be able to preserve that conversation, we have to make sure we understand how the regulatory changes might um, uh, undermine that. And section 230 has shown us how we can create an environment where people can talk to each other. Um, I don't think we should take that for granted. Yeah, Jeff, do you wanna follow up on that? Yeah. So. I, I want to get to the point, and this is just um, a few points about what did Congress intend with Section 230, because that's a really difficult question to answer. Um, I get asked a lot, particularly by people who have specific problems, either that there's too much or too little moderation. Did Congress anticipate uh, foreign countries interfering with our election? Uh, pro probably not in 1996. When you look at the floor debate about uh, Section 230 in the House, there is a member of the House who is asking about um, how you can get all of the websites that you visit to appear on your phone bill. Um, it, 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 the, the la I, I think a few people knew what, what knew what they wanted. I think Cox and Wyden knew what they wanted. I think a lot of the members did not, but I don't, and I mean, frankly, I'm going to say I, I don't know for sure the Zarin opinion, which gave a broad interpretation. I, I think if you ask an average house member, did you think this is what it would be? I don't know what your response would be. Uh, and I think that if you look at three specific changes in the bill between when it passed in the house as an amendment and when it got into conference committee, there were some changes, the good Samaritan language that you're talking about. Um, that's before both C1 and C2. Uh, in the initial version that went through the House before conference committee, but was passed in the House, the C1 and C2 were one section. And then they added the subsections, the treatment of publisher and speaker and civil liability. Uh, I, so I, you could read that either one way or the other, whether, well, was it the intent of the House that passed the amendment? Was it the intent of the final congressional vote? I don't know. Uh, another thing that was removed from Section 230 uh, in conference committee, because it, I think it probably conflicted with the CDA, was what was really driving the sort of the persuasive case that Cox and Wyden were making, which was a provision that specifically said the FCC shall not regulate the content on the internet. That ended up getting uh, stricken in conference committee, but that was really, when you look at the very little media coverage of the Cox Wyden bill, that was what that, that what they were focusing on. And then the third thing that was added in conference committee was in section E, an extra line that clarifies there's not gonna be any liability under state law, which I think in the, con so when you look at all of that, I think it became much more of a broader liability protection in before the final vote than when it was initially introduced. Now, again, you could, I, I think that could be read either way, you know, should we go by the intent of the house when they amended it, or, or the final bill, I, again, that's, uh, I, I think you'd have arguments on both sides, but the bottom line is, I, I mean, I, I don't think you can say with any certainty, this is what Congress intended, but at the same time, now we have this interpretation with hundreds of cases that are built on Zarin and very few that have really directly questioned it without being overturned. And the question is, where do we go from here uh, at, at this point? Absolutely. So I kind of want to I want to talk briefly about um, SESTA FOSTA before we turn to questions. Um, for those who aren't familiar, uh, SESTA FOSTA was um, an, uh, a law that passed to basically uh, specifically um, allow sites that I don't actually I'm going to miss I'm going to kind of misstate this in some way. But Jeff, you can correct me um, or Eric. Um, 
the, uh, hold on, we have a technical difficulty. Eric, do you actually want to just explain SESTA FOSTA really quickly and how it came out of the Doe v. Backpage decision? So uh, SESTA FOSTA was really Congress's first um, effort to carve back Section 230. Um, throughout the first 20 plus years of it, uh, Congress mostly left it alone. Uh, I will point out in 2010, they actually doubled down on it by enacting what was called the Speech Act to say that if someone got a foreign judgment um, that uh, it was, would have been inconsistent with Section 230, it couldn't be enforced in the US. So up to 2010, Congress is still giving all thumbs up to uh, Section 230. Um, but uh, but uh, then um, in response to a series of concerns about uh, the promotion of sex trafficking victims online, um, Congress took a closer look at that particular issue and how Section 230 interacts with it. Um, it actually started it with a prior act called the SAVE Act, where um, Congress expanded the scope of federal crimes, which are not covered by Section 230 by its terms, um, to cover a wider range of things that might involve publication of third-party advertising. Um, unhappy that that apparently didn't do the job that Congress wanted, Congress then came back to it with what was initially FOSTA, then it became SESTA and Senate, and what ultimately passed was a version uh, called FOSTA. Um, and these laws were in response to uh, um, the Backpage website, which uh, starting around 2010, after Craigslist exited the industry, really consolidated the, um, uh, the uh, database of uh, third-party advertisements promoting commercial sex. Um, and uh, Craigslist had uh, many of those ads uh, prior to that, but Craigslist didn't really want them. They didn't quite know how to get rid of them. Whereas Backpage, I think, fairly characterized, viewed uh, the ads for commercial sex is a profit-making opportunity. So they built an entire website that was um, designed to help uh, expand their wealth while uh, uh, making available ads for commercial sex. Um, and uh, Backpage won a string of Section 230 rulings, including Section 230 rulings striking down some state laws trying to curb its activity. Um, and so that just didn't make any sense to Congress. How could Section 230 be, be, be uh, uh, sheltering this service that had this database of uh, commercial sex advertisements and was making money from it? And knowing that some of those ads were gonna be uh, promoting victims of sex trafficking. Um, and that's not the, something that Backpage, I think, wanted, but they didn't now have a, a mechanism to prevent that from occurring. The best they could do is try and figure it out when it happened. And, uh, and work with the authorities from there. Um, so to make sure Backpage uh, uh, exited the industry, Congress enacted FOSTA, which did a series of things, or really several operating parts. They in part expanded the scope of federal crimes again to try to make sure that what wasn't covered by Section 230 would more directly uh, cover a site like Backpage. They also carved back the uh, uh, Section 230's limits um, on uh, state criminal en enforcements and uh, uh, civil plaintiff enforcements to the extent that those uh, enforcement actions would um, uh, uh, relate to the uh, promotion of uh, sex trafficking victims um, or uh, the promotion of pro commercial sex. So they, they tried to carve back, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, not the commercial sex part, just the um, promotion of sex trafficking part. They tried to carve back Section 230 to, to create this zone of extra liability without Section 230's protection uh, that um, uh, different plaintiffs could then enforce. The DOJ under the federal crimes that were expanded, and then state AGs or uh, possibly local enforcement agencies, as well as civil plaintiffs being able to bring lawsuits, all targeting Backpage. Now, as it turned out, Backpage exited the industry before um, uh, the law was passed. Uh, they um, uh, 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 struck a plea deal and their uh, services were raided by the FBI and shut down before the law came into effect. So by the time the law came into effect, Backpage was already gone, but this law targeting Backpage then um, uh, came onto the books. And Marianne, I, you have drafted a number of laws that have gone into effect, and I don't know what your count is, um, that deal with uh, revenge porn and criminalizing of revenge porn um, in various states. Um, what was your, what, like, what have you, what have you seen about SESTA-FOSTA that kind of 
struck you as accurate or that you didn't like or that you kind of that you supported when it was um, being uh, debated? And how do you think it interacts with other types of laws that like your like revenge porn laws that are happening in state level? Right. So um, as a kind of preface to this, though, I do want to say, because we I think the thread got a little bit lost about the Good Samaritans because it relates a little bit to what um, Eric was talking about, which is the idea that, you know, you want to protect good actors from doing things imperfectly. But I don't think that that's actually very complicated. That's exactly what a Good Samaritan law does. It's there because if everything goes perfectly, you don't need immunity, right? So if someone's having a heart attack and you do CPR perfectly well, there's no reason for you to have immunity. The problem is what if the guy dies or if you crack a rib? That's what immunity is for. I mean, it, the Good Samaritan immunity is a very recognized, easily recognized concept in the law, which is you didn't have a duty of care, you acted in good faith anyway, and you didn't do it perfectly. And that's why we want you to have immunity because we want to incentivize people to do the right thing. So that makes perfect sense if you're trying to think about what we want to have happen um, online. And to this idea of you know, underestimating how good this has been or how much you know, Section 230 allows people to speak freely, I would just underscore again, who are we talking about? Um, if you ask women, if you ask racial minorities, if you ask sexual minorities how freely they feel that they can speak online, listen to them tell you about the death threats and the revenge porn and the doxing and the stalking and all the rest of it, that's actually making it very hard for them to speak. And in some ways harder than it was before um, the online revolution and in some ways more painful than the online revolution before because that revolution promised to be exactly that, that those people who were having um, these kinds of unfair discriminatory practices that kept them out of these spaces were going to suddenly be liberated. Well, who gets to spend most of their time talking online? Who's dominating Twitter? Who's dominating Facebook? Who's dominating search engine results? Who's actually making those decisions? Who's sitting at the top of every one of those tech companies saying, oops, we didn't know that live stream was going to cause problems for some people or that murder would be a thing that people would want to do on it. So I think we always wanna be careful about saying, oh, it's worked for, it's, it's brought us so many great things. The question should always be who has it brought great things for and what kinds of preventable foreseeable harms has it not actually um, addressed? But to the point of FOSTA SESTA, this is, you know, one of the things we haven't talked about much is that one of the exceptions to Section 230 immunity is violations of federal criminal law. And that's been something poorly understood, I think, by a lot of people because it's complicated and not entirely intuitive. Um, my sense is that carve outs are a bad idea for Section 230. There's nothing really to be gained by saying, here's this really bad thing that we think should be um, prohibited um, that should not get this kind of Section 230 immunity. The carve out approach is basically saying implicitly this thing is more serious than all the other kinds of harms that could occur and it makes the statute more complicated and it makes it even harder for people to understand and probably has any number of unintended consequences. One of the positions that I've taken is that if you really think something is truly horrific and needs to be something that doesn't ever receive Section 230 immunity, you should ensure that it is in fact a violation of federal criminal law. So um, what you're asking about, Kate, is that um, we've worked on the state level, we're up to 46 states now that have laws against non-consensual pornography, but we have not really gotten anywhere with our federal bill, which has been introduced three times. And the effect of that would be if you declare that non-consensual pornography or violations of sexual privacy were, was a federal criminal offense, then you wouldn't have Section 230 immunity against it. So you, the, the, these kinds of companies or these sites that actually deliberately solicit this kind of material wouldn't be able to be able to take um, protection under that. And I think that would be a good thing. So when we're trying to figure out carve outs in this kind of dysfunctional world we're living in because of Section 230, one thing to keep in mind is really serious crimes probably ought to be prohibited by federal criminal law and sex trafficking already was. And so there's also a lot of duplicativeness um, to this. But there is, of course, the remaining question of whether or not individual victims can recover um, damages, which is not something resolved by the violation of federal criminal law, which is part of what um, Vasa Sesta attempted to do. But I don't think it's the right approach. I think if we're going to reform Section 230, it has to try to address some of these structural problems and not try to pick and choose which particular acts we think are um, somehow especially um, heinous or, or harmful. Jeff, any thoughts on that? Um, I know that you were active in the debate around SESTA FOSTA um, and consulted with a lot of lawmakers on it. Um, and uh, I, you know, I, I happen, I think that I, I very much agree with Marianne and this, not on, just in the sense that I 
think that these tiny carve outs of special of certain types of behavior that we're going to decide don't get uh, the qual like take you outside section 230 immunity is a very piecemeal and messy, messy way to kind of go about uh, with reform. Um, but uh, what do you what were your thoughts when that was all being drafted? Yeah, so I testified in the House Judiciary Committee in October 2017, uh, saying that I, that Congress should consider uh, and should pass an amendment to Section 230 to address sex trafficking. I did think that the back page, the First Circuit back page opinion that prompted a lot of this, I thought that was poorly decided. But in light, I mean, I I think it also demonstrated that you perhaps can't rely on courts to correct. That, uh, that opinion. Uh, I think that the final product was not what I was thinking about, and mostly because it was the sort of, and I don't deal enough with the legislative process, so I don't know if this is always the case, but it was really cobbled together based on different compromises. And the final product, I mean, it, had, it creates this one cause of action that it's not even clear if it's exempt from Section 230. It had the the standard for the the center the standard is indecipherable. I, I don't know how a judge is going to look at that because it's different standards on top of one another. Um, and I'm I'm hoping that I mean as, I mean I think that further changes to Section 230 are inevitable at this point. And I'm hoping the process um, is a bit more deliberate uh, because there were some versions before the final bill that I think were much better at getting at the bad actors and there, there are bad actors uh, but i i think that what we end, what we got out of the final bill i'm not sure what impact what i i'm not sure i think we still have to see cases are just really starting a few cases starting to be brought but uh i i'd like to see a more deliberate process next time yeah we're going to circle back to this at the end of the week we have um a sex worker who is an activist around Sesta Fosta and thinks that it's been very harmful to kind of uh, professional sex workers and other other things, um, and Kendra Albert from uh, from uh, Harvard, uh, talking about uh, really what the world has looked like once Section two thirty immunity has gone away in the context of SESTA Fosta in the context of sex work, um, which I think is going to be a really fascinating kind of window into uh, into this question. Um, but I think I'm going to pivot to some of we are getting a we have a very long list of curious people that have really great questions. And the first one is from Enrique Armillo. Hey, Enrique, nice to see you. Um, I am going to unmute you and you can go ahead and ask your question. Let me see. You there? You should be unmuted. Enrique? Okay, we will come back. Can you hear me? Yep, there you go. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, everybody. This has been terrific. Um, Marianne touched on this a little bit, um, but this is really a question, um, you know, Judge Easterbrook has asked it, Ben Persky has asked it, So, and uh, I have not come up with an answer myself. Why would Congress use the conditional term of Good Samaritan to grant an unconditional immunity for content moderation? Eric? Yeah, um, and I really think that Marianne framed the issue nicely about the value of Good Samaritan statutes, that without those, we don't have people tried. But if they are miscalibrated, we still don't have people tried. So it leaves an awkward situation where if we don't get the, the, the you must do the following things when you try standards correct, then, um, uh, then either the publishers won't try They'll simply go back to the rule of CompuServe that the secretary is designed to overcome, which is so long as you don't know or shouldn't have known, you get uh, you get uh, the immunity. Um, that's the kind of thing that we were trying to to overcome. Um, so uh, so setting up a condition there, if it's not perfectly calibrated, drives us right back to the the whole CompuServe standard in the uh, first instance. Um, and I think one of the beauties of Section 230 is that it really forces us, uh, it takes us away from asking the question, what are the right ways to edit or manage content? Um, this is not like a doctor applying CPR to a patient 
um, uh, who uh, is experiencing respiratory arrest. Um, and we want the doctor to rush in, and even if they don't exercise, do medical care, we still want them to help this person who, uh, th this uh, forlorn bystander. Um, we're talking about a, a wide range of, of editorial practices that um, uh, are really hard to, to summarize. Um, and to then start to slice and dice in a way that would be coherent. So the idea isn't that the way you framed it, of course, is a leading question, but the real question is, could we set up anything that encouraged services to try, however they meant that, without discouraging them and driving us right back to the CompuServe rule? And by establishing a, a, the same rule for anywhere on the spectrum between doing zero to try, like a CompuServe type model, to doing everything in your power to try um, and still not getting it done perfectly. Um, we actually make sure that we get, we, we create the opportunity for people to move further on to that spectrum um, and do more uh, uh, to actually intervene. Um, as I said, if we don't get the, the uh, standards just right, then we actually everyone moves off the spectrum and, and never tries in hopes that they can still uh, get the copy server rule. Can I say a little bit about that though? Because please do. What what signal are we using, or what measure are we using to think that we've got it right now? Um, in other words, if it's so complicated to think about the right standards, uh, we have to be saying status quo is better than what exactly. Um, and I think that the the force of the question is: Look, law knows how to handle these things, not perfectly, because nothing is perfect. But if every industry almost and every actor outside of the online context has to deal with these kinds of ambiguities, why does the tech industry uniquely need this kind of um, protection? Because again, it's immunity, which is a short circuiting. It's not just that you never can be, if you didn't have the immunity, it's not like you suddenly become strictly liable for everything. That's not how any of that would work. But again, the notion of the Good Samaritan idea is packed into the concept of is there a duty of care to begin with? Because if there is, you were not, we shouldn't even be talking about Good Samaritan immunity. Um, so if we're actually gonna take that concept seriously, we need to think about what the law has been doing ever since the law was the law, long before there was ever anything like the internet. And then ask ourselves the harder question, which is not how do we incentivize um, companies to get it right? How would we incentivize companies to do anything? Um, how do we, anything right? How do we incentivize them not to simply just profit off of the engagement, which Let's face it, the stuff that actually hurts people is what people engage in. So the harder question is not, oh no, what would we do otherwise? It's what are we doing about what's happening right now? What is the possible incentive for a company to develop innovative, smart ways of actually having um, increased communication and less injurious stuff when you get the immunity, whether you do nothing uh, or whether you do something really great? And not only that, you're allowed to profit if from other people's injury. So. This is a classic moral hazard. You tell a company, an industry, you can do whatever you like and you get to reap all the benefits from it and you never have to absorb the negative consequences of it. On what planet is any platform going to say, you know, based on that, I'm actually going to spend lots of time and resources in coming up with some really good moderation. So the answer uh, and, and to the practical question, well, what would force them to actually do something better than now? Almost anything would be better than now. But if we do want to talk about the pragmatics, you can simply say in Section 230, you have to have a notice product process. You can't just say, I'm going to bury my head in the sand and just uh, ignore everything that comes my way. But, but backing up quite a lot just to say, again, Good Samaritan immunity is contingent upon not having a duty of care to begin with and then engaging in good faith practices to try to help someone. And that's not an insoluble thing because law has been dealing with those types of questions about liability and contributory liability and vicarious liability and all those questions before the internet did not in fact change everything. I, I, Kate, it's Kate, um, I, I don't know if Jeb wants to type in, but I, I do have some issues with what Marianne just said that I would like to add. Go, no, please go okay. ahead. I was going to respond too, but Jeff, I don't want Jeff to feel left out of the combo. Go ahead. If I have something to add, I will after. Go ahead, Eric. So Marianne, you asked a really provocative question on what planet would any company choose to do socially valuable moderation work given that they could avoid liability for not Can I just say it? really quickly that it's not Hoth? It's definitely not Hoth that that planet is. Like, <laughs> sorry. Hoth, Hoth has <laughs> many communication problems that we don't have here on Earth because of Section 230. Now, you ask that question and you know the answer. I know the answer. Everyone knows the answer. Earth is where internet companies will do socially valuable moderation work 
um, despite having the legal protection if they choose not to do so. Now, economics would say that's irrational. They are wasting those investments. That would be a very narrow understanding of the motivations of companies that they, to think that the only reason that they would choose to do or not do something is because of the uh, legal um, insulation. They have a wide range of other objectives that they're trying to optimize. And as a result, because of that, we have seen millions of dollars invested by individual companies in trying to do the kind of socially valuable moderation work that Section 2 there says they don't have to do. Now, uh, so I don't really know where we get by, by asking this hypothetical question. Why would they? We know they do. We know that they're already motivated. And the reason why is because they know if they dial up their efforts to intervene, they're not opting into extra liability that they would have opted into under the old prodigy rule. And they know that if they don't get it perfectly, they're not liable for what they, they miss. That's the whole point of Section 230. That's the core that allows them to make those, uh, those choices. So are they getting it perfect? No. And guess what? They never will. It is impossible to do perfect content moderation. The whole idea of content moderation is to make winners and losers. And the losers of that decision, the people who didn't get the outcomes that they wanted, will always feel like it should have been done differently or better. So um, there is no planet in the universe where there will be perfect content moderation with a different liability scheme. The question that you asked, and I think this is the right question, what is the alternative? How can we calibrate the policies to get to a better outcome? And this is the challenge because no matter what, there's going to be really tough balancing acts, uh, uh, the, uh, a balancing that's going to need to be done between different options. And you asked the question, well, what makes the internet unique compared to other media? The answer is we have a bunch of ways that humans interact and communicate with each other on the internet that doesn't exist in the offline world, could not exist in the uh, uh, offline world because of the liability scheme. So the, we may not value those, that's okay. If you wanna say, I don't value those, go ahead and say that. But if you value those, the question is, how do we make sure that those actually exist? And changing the liability scheme might change the availability of the services or might eliminate them entirely. And that's just a balancing act that we have to choose between. But there's no perfect answer here where we're gonna get all of the great and none of the bad. That's it. That option is on the table. So we're all going to have to figure out how are we going to make a, a balancing between all the different considerations. Yeah. Um, Marianne, I'm going to let you respond really quickly if you want to. Um, but then we are going to have to go to the next question. Yeah. So I'll make this quick. I mean, no one. I mean, it's an utter straw man to try to say anybody's, well, I shouldn't say anybody. I'm not trying to say there should be a perfect solution here. And I wouldn't even phrase it because I'm not totally captured by this ideology. I wouldn't talk about is it perfect content moderation? It's much more fundamental than that. The idea that you are allowed to make profit off of injury to others with no responsibilities is a problem. It is something that no industry should be allowed to do. And so that is the problem. So yes, we can, we can say, oh, there's winners and losers. Of course there are. What I'm pointing out is, isn't it interesting how the winners are always the same people and the losers are always the same people? And I mean that in the sense of not anecdote, not to say, oh, look at this one instance where women are able to talk and racial minorities can actually have a hashtag. What I mean to say is, as a general structural matter, we need to be asking vulnerable groups that have always had their access to communications um, undermined, how much have they actually been able to progress in terms of gaining some of the access to speech and communication that white men, especially white wealthy men, have always enjoyed? And to the extent that we've now had almost 20 years, uh, more than 20 years, um, of, of looking at the situation uh, of the internet benefiting certain groups and not others, why are we satisfied with that? So I understand why some people are, but I'm saying that that's exactly the question. Why are we satisfied with the status quo when it actually hasn't revolutionized speech and it hasn't actually radicalized speech for the groups of people who were from the very beginning, the ones actually suffering under the burdens of against their freedom of expression. First Amendment is supposed to be protecting truth, autonomy and democracy. Let's take a, you know, an audit around us and think how much we think this current environment we're living in, this precise historical moment is better when it comes to protecting truth, when it comes to protecting people's autonomy, or when it comes to protecting people's democratic participation. Indeed, we might disagree, but I would suggest that there's got to be a better world than this. I, I have to say that what I hear when I'm listening to the two of you talk, and I've heard you talk about this many times individually, I don't know if I've ever ha seen you on the exact same panel, but maybe I have. I 
there's been so many, but I'm very much struck by the fact that I, I do believe that you both kind of, you want to protect vulnerable populations and you want to kind of make the, the internet a better place, but you just are kind of at, uh, not even, I, not even, I find that I'm like this time listening to you, I feel like you're disagreeing or like, I think that you're very much in the same place on kind of the moral issue of this and the kind of communities that you want to help and to kind of have uh, kind of reform, if there is reform of section 230 play out, just you're just kind of an opposite about exactly how that happens um, and what what the effects of the various kind of changes would be. Um, but that being said, um, Kate, uh, Kate um, Diamo, Damo? Dadamo, I'm gonna kill. I'm just gonna stop. <laughs> Kate, you are <laughs> unmuted. <laughs> please, please ask your question. It was excellent, and I think it ties in really well to the discussion we're having right now. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, and yeah, I, I, I feel like this question is kind of building on the conversation that's already being generated here, which is, you know, how do 230 advocates really see themselves, um, or do they kind of in conversation? Uh, to uh, around addressing harm, harm more broadly, you know, since we're talking about what is essentially like a digital extension of other forms of structural inter and interpersonal harm, whether we're talking about revenge porn and intimate partner violence, or um, as Marianne was just saying, kind of uh, deep platforming um, uh, marginalized communities, um, how how do you see this conversation as in conversation with impacted communities? And I also will. Um, add on that I'm approaching this very much from the understanding that, you know, when we were talking about FOSTA SESTA before it passed, these uh, addition of FOSTA was really about tech platformings taking that liability and displacing it onto marginalized communities and saying that marginalized communities should face increased criminal liability instead of platforms facing additional civil liability. And so knowing that the history of this conversation has been very much about um, putting marginalized communities in the line of fire instead of tech platforms, um, as well as kind of the reliance on criminal legal mechanisms in general, which generally are going to disproportionately impact marginalized communities, how do you see all of those things in play together? Uh, anyone is open to take that question. I think it, Jeff, do you want to say something? So I think that's a really important question. And I mean, I'll say from my perspective, I talk with anyone and everyone about uh, their ideas for Section 230 reform, uh, whether it should or shouldn't be reformed. And I, I think that oftentimes there are many different Section 230 discussions that are happening based on which community that you're having a discussion with. Um, I mean, I, and this is where it gets really difficult to say, you know, this is the solution because I will, I mean, I'll give an example. Last week I spoke with uh, one group that believes that uh, Section 230, that the platforms because of Section 230 are in violation of Section 230 are uh, blocking certain political viewpoints. This is something we haven't talked about on this call um, or on, at, on this panel, but I think it's actually something that's really driving a lot of the national debate. Whether you agree with it or disagree with it uh, is another thing. But then I also spoke with folks who think that there is not enough mod moderation, particularly of content that harms certain communities uh, and that harms women, that harms uh, racial minorities. and. I think that, that's important also. I, the, the problem that I'm having is how, how to address all of those things because I'm really trying to see if we have solutions that address all of those issues. I mean, my, again, my personal view is that Section 230 has never required platforms to be ne neutral and that's the whole point of Section 230. And uh, to get back to the conversation that Eric and Marianne were having just before, I mean, Section 230 is very much, and they didn't, always explicitly say it, but it's very much a market-based law. It's saying, you know, the I mean, the platforms will have the moderation that, that their users expect and will provide the experience that their users expect, expect because if they don't, then there will be other platforms. And now the question could be, well, I mean, will what would be the next Facebook? What would be the next Twitter? Will there be one? Uh, and that's an important question. I mean, I will point out there's a 
cover story, I think a fortune from 2007 or 2008 that says, has a big picture across the front page and it says, um, will anyone ever beat MySpace or something <laughs> like that? And the answer is, yeah, I mean, the, the market can decide things, but have they gotten too big at, the, at this point? I mean, I think that's, that's an important question we have to be asking. Um, I'm going to add a couple of things. Um, there, there, it was such a rich question. We could actually have an entire panel just on it. Um, I think that um, uh, the first one is that um, concerns about how the media handles and represents marginalized communities are as age old as the media um, or as age old as media studies. Um, so I think one of the questions I struggle with or underlying assumptions in the question I struggle with is, is, is the internet different on that front? Um, or is this just a common critique of media? The internet has the same challenges that other media has. Um, the other thing I'll point out is that I'm seeing just a, a, a hotbed of litigation by people who have majority attributes weaponizing civil rights laws to try to perpetuate their majority. So uh, for all the concerns about the marginalized communities who might be affected by uh, internet companies' decisions, um, what we're seeing is that the uh, people going to court are the people who are in the majority seeking to manage and uh, 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 confirm their uh, incumbency using the legal tools. Now, Section 2 they actually prevents those lawsuits. We might say that's actually a good thing. Um, but just recognize that the law is a tool here. It's a very blunt instrument. And uh, it isn't just will be weaponized, uh, well, I mean, sorry, will be embraced by the people who need it the most, will be weaponized by the folks who really don't need it to try to uh, perpetuate their power. And of course, that's right, but um, there's also the First Amendment, which protects a lot of this to be, we don't actually need Section 230 to say, you know, platforms have the right to take down content that they don't like. Um, the First Amendment gives them that right. So there's, it's, it's not as though Section 230 built our entire world, but um, I do also want to say in response to the question, it's exactly what the work of those of us who are working in the cyber civil rights um, area are trying to do. We're trying to work to ask the questions about who is the current system benefiting? Who has it always benefited? Um, and so, of course, we're as horrified as anyone that this um, Section 230 reform question has become so politicized that suddenly conservative re Republican men with power are saying, hey, we're not so sure we like the free market when it doesn't work in our favor. Of course, we're not happy about that, which is why we're not signing on to these really ill-conceived reforms. But we're also not going to accept the hijacking of the Section 230 reform movement and dismiss all of the critiques of Section 230 as being that because they're not that. Um, when Jeff talks about users and talks about companies um, responding to their user interests and the question of how possible is it now given how big some of these companies are, one of the things I want to, to keep emphasizing is who do we mean by users when we use that, that kind of term? Because if vulnerable populations don't have critical mass, how much difference is it going to make anyway? And if we want to talk about the question of monopolies and how big these companies have gotten, part of the reason how they got so big was because they didn't have to absorb the cost of the negative consequences of their products. So we can't talk about this and say, oh, it's a shame that they've gotten so big. Um, too bad about that. Part of the reason why they got there is because they don't have to make these kinds of calculations unless they feel like it. And Eric's absolutely right to say some of them feel like it sometimes. Sometimes Twitter is actually going to slap a little label on something. but. <laughs> The fact that, or the idea that all of us would have to be subject to essentially the mercy or the attention of whatever passing um, idea any of these companies get, that's not to discredit any of these companies for the work that they're doing, but it is a problem to say to all the people who are being harmed every day by the kinds of things that do happen online unchecked, that they are at the mercy of these companies having a PR crisis or having some ethical person within their ranks saying we should do something about this. That's not an answer, especially when the very problems that these companies are now trying to fix are problems they created. So it has become the modus operandi of most of these platforms. Create a problem, make it as bad as possible, and then instigate some sort of modest reforms that might do some harm mitigation at the edges and congratulate yourself for having done some hard work of innovation. And I think that is a model that we absolutely have to reject now. Yeah, I think that that's a, that I, I take both of your points and I think that, I think, I don't know, I have, I've, where it's, it's a little bit, we don't have enough time to kind of get into it, but I'm really kind of, I've long thought that if there was any type of reform that specifically um, one of the things that we want to kind of promote here is the growth of new platforms in this space and all of these types of, I think that's good for speech. I think it's good for, um, I think it's good for uh, communities that are, that are harassed and highlighted to be able to form their own safe spaces. Um, but I really, 
I really do have like, you know, I do think that there's issues of scale that happen when you have, um, when you have like large, large platforms and you have smaller platforms and you decide to treat them all the same. Um, but I, I digress. Uh, we have so many questions. We're not going to be able to get to all of them. Um, Michael Karen Colas, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, unmute yourself. Hi. Uh, thanks so much for this uh, fascinating conversation. Uh, this is really great. Um, I was hoping to pick up uh, on something that Professor Goldman mentioned uh, a little while back regarding the enforcement of Section 230 to protect against foreign judgments. Um, and I was curious as to whether that's ever been applied and can it apply beyond matters of defamation. And I was thinking specifically, say uh, a user in Sri Lanka or Myanmar or Indonesia or, or places where there have been real harms um, perpetrated as a result of speech on these platforms is trying to pursue domestic remedies of some kind. Um, do you, is, is there, has there ever been applicability uh, or cases similar to that um, of, of Section 230 protecting against that kind of foreign enforcement actions? Uh, so uh, the Speech Act, uh, as I said, was passed about a decade ago, uh, and it was designed to curb what was sometimes called libel tourism. The idea that uh, defamation plaintiffs can go shopping for the most favorable forum in the world, uh, get a judgment there, and then enforce it in uh, courts where the legal standard would be different, but the, the standard for enforcing the foreign judgment might be more favorable. Um, so the Speech Act is uh, specific to defamation, but it defines defamation in a surprisingly broad way. It includes, uh, uh, I think, references to privacy that might pick up some things that uh, we might consider more the purview of privacy law than typical standard defamation. Um, but the other examples you're describing um, may or are likely outside the scope of the Speech Act. It is focused principally on defamation. And it has been applied here in the US, but only in a couple of cases. It's pretty rare. Um, I just think most plaintiffs don't try, knowing that it, you know, A, they have to go through the hoops of jumping uh, to get the foreign judgment, and then B, knowing that they're gonna have a really difficult time here in the US. It's, uh, th there's other ways for them to potentially proceed that are better than trying to test the speech act. Jeff, anything? Any yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm only aware of maybe two cases uh, that, that I've seen that have specifically applied it. So yeah, I, I would agree with all of that. Okay. Um, we have Martha Minow uh, here. Martha, it's wonderful to see you. Um, please uh, go ahead and ask your question. Thank you very much, and thanks to you all. Hi, this is such a great conversation. I'm just wondering what is the most sensible framework for conceiving of the internet platforms? Uh, the question about distributor, publisher, speaker, none of the above. And obviously because of the volume that the very popular platforms have to deal with, reliance on algorithm moderation is so uh, likely. So what framework gives the right incentives to, and what would keep humans in the loop of moderation? What do you, what, who wants to take that first? Marianne, I feel like this is, you're right in your wheelhouse. So I think it's a great question. And I think one of the, the challenges for law, of course, is always to figure out the right analogies or, or to at least to understand when the analogies, um, the limitations of our analogies. So what, one of the interesting things about the early cases that Jeff made reference to is that was what the courts were trying to figure out, right? Are these publishers? Are they distributors? Is it like a library? Is it like a newsstand? Is it... And I think the online library idea is kind of an interesting one for at least some mm -hmm. of the platforms. Um, but then again, this I think it really does underscore this question of how much of what we're dealing with online is actually speech. I think so long as we're actually dealing with speech, we might have analogies that are useful, at least up to a point. And I think the library um, idea is interesting. But um, as you made reference to in terms of the algorithmic optimization and amplification, I don't know if we have an analogy for that, right? If there's any library out there that would promote certain types of materials um, and basically hide other kinds. I'm not sure if we, we have a way of talking about it. But I also do think it really does underscore that question of how limited are all of these kinds of speech outlet types of things to what goes on online. Um, back to Daniel versus arms list, what is the possible analogy there, right? That, that's directly just related to speech. It's not just a newspaper. It's not just um, a library. 
all kinds of interactions that happen online kind of defy those, those analogies, um, uh, defy the analogies that are based solely in the speech realm. But I think they don't necessarily defy analogies like what about a hotel that has poor security and a mass shooter is able to slip in and kill a lot of people, right? As we saw in the Las Vegas shooting and the MGM um, litigation, which didn't um, go very far. But you know, th th we have questions about um, what if you're playing some sort of marginal role, that is to say, not actively promoting the harm, but not doing enough to prevent it. Or you're taking a cut of profits when you know that someone is coming to your hotel um, with young girls all the time, and you're pretty sure of what's going on there, but you're not entirely sure. We have analogies in the law to think about those, and I think part of the problem with Section 230 is that it gives us tunnel vision about thinking in terms of newspapers and newsstands and libraries when a lot of what goes online just won't, don't, it does not in fact actually um, resemble any of that activity. And we need to think about all the analogies that we might have at our disposal in terms of premises liability and dram shop um, laws and things of that nature that tell us something about how individuals and entities contribute to harm in ways that sometimes the law will find them responsible for. Jeff, do you want to build on that? Because I feel like uh, Martha's question really gets at this idea, and Marianne really fleshed this out um, just now, gets at this idea of using this analogy to defamation. And as you acknowledge, that was the basis of like of, of bookstore kind of analogy of how all of the, how Section 230 came into effect. And I think Martha's question is really wonderful in that it just kind of puts forward this idea that like if we just come up if we have if we update this analogy will we solve a lot of the problems that we're that we're starting to have jack balkan talks about communications torts everything on the internet can all conduct can look like communication right because it all happens through typing right that all happens through reading it all happens through consuming um information and so if it, everything looks like information uh, or we're used to thinking of something in to information, we, it becomes black and white in a way that really doesn't emphasize all of the gray that has developed between 1996 and today in this, in like in in how the internet looks and how it how it functions. So, what do you think about that in light of the legislative history of of the law? Yeah. So, I, and I spent a lot of time writing a book that tries to draw analogies to different areas of the law, and that increasingly convinced me that perhaps there are not appropriate analogies for what we have here and what we, I mean, we we might need to be looking at what are our ultimate values and our goals and what, how, what do we want to achieve and how do we want to achieve them and we might just not be able to rely on a bookstore or newspaper publisher analogy because I, I mean, book, bookstores, yes, you could, you could draw some analogies, but I mean, at the heart, they they're doing very different things. They might pick which book to place in front of the store, things like that. But it, the impacts and the scale is so different. And they're making so, they're making a very different amounts of money off, very, of, very off, much, of, yes. off of the sale of things than a bookstore is. Like, right? So a bookstore doesn't have advertisements around yeah. its books. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. So, I, I mean, I and that's where that's why I spend so much time trying to talk with folks to figure out what are our ultimate goals here? Um, I was on, uh, last year I was on Kara Swisher's podcast with two people who have very different views on Section 230, uh, Mike Masnick and Carrie Goldberg. And um, Kara uh, asked at the end, uh, you know, what's your idea? What, what do you think Congress should do? And she, I, my idea, which she said was not totally stupid, so that's high praise, uh, was, uh, that we need to gather more facts uh, about what's possible and come to a better consensus of what our goals are. Um, my other area of research is cybersecurity, and Congress uh, for the past year had chartered a cyber solarium commission that gathered facts, really thorough report, and came up with really specific uh, legislative re recommendations for cybersecurity that I, I think have a very high likelihood of passing. Uh, we haven't really had that deliberate process we we on um, platforms, and I'd like to see that um, because we I mean so much I mean Kate the work that you've done has really helped to highlight at least some of the what what's currently happening and what's possible. And there are other scholars, uh, Charlton Gillespie, Sarah Roberts, who have been doing that as well. And I think that on the policy side, we need to be able to sort of gather more of that information because there has really been a lack of transparency until recently from the platforms to see, you know, what is possible? I mean, who, can they be doing more? What can they be doing more? I mean, as Eric said, there's not gonna be any perfect situation. 
uh, where every the moderation is perfect and satisfies everyone. But I mean, w before we start making changes to the law, I think we need to have a better factual basis about what what is possible and also have a better alignment of what goals are we aiming for. So for analogies, I mean, I, 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 I've struggled with this and I mean, I, I think there are some similarities with the bookstore distributor, but it really does kind of fall apart when you start looking at the impact of those, of the laws. So, I mean, I think we really need to overall just do better at gathering our factual basis for whatever changes we'll make. Yeah, I Thank totally you. agree with that. Thanks. We have about six minutes left Thanks. and I Thanks. would like to start Thanks. wrapping up. Um, could Eric, we'd like to give kind of Eric and then we'll go to Marianne and then Jeff, if you have any like kind of last words, go ahead, Eric. I'm sorry, I did want to just follow up on the, yeah. the Martha's question on two points. One, I just wanted to clarify, I don't use the term platform at all. I really think that that term uh, masks some really key and significant factual questions about what's actually happening. I just use the term publisher and I get straight to the point. I think that's what's really taking place here. I think as you described, Kate, uh, Jack's view that everything in, that when data is moving online is in my mind a publication and then we have to um, evaluate accordingly. I did wanna also pick up on Martha's point about, um, she said, what can we do to get more humans in the loop? And I just, there's two points. I just wanna make sure we didn't lose on that thread. One is that just like machines, humans have the biases. And so it's not clear to me that we want the human biases directly or if we uh, might get better results with machines. Both of them are gonna be biased. The only question is which biases are they gonna codify and can, uh, which ones are, are less objectionable. Um, the other thing is that uh, having humans in the loop means that they're gonna be exposed to content that really can be part of a long-term uh, uh, challenge for them psychologically. And so uh, trying to move more things to humans comes at a human cost to people we don't normally deal with, but we shouldn't ignore. Um, in terms of the overall wrap up, uh, thank you for letting me uh, take a few moments before I got to that. Um, I just wanna say, um, I, I really, I, I framed the question in the beginning, you know, do we value the ability to talk to each other online? Um, because I feel like that's the soul of the internet and that soul is right now at, at, a, at a high degree of peril. I think that our politicians are now prepared to burn down the internet in the name of trying to fix it. And I don't think they realize how much we as individuals drive personal value from the internet, how much it can be part of healthy social interactions in addition to the fact that it can enable unhealthy ones. There's so many good things that are taking place on the internet that we take for granted. Um, when we look at the, the shutdown and how we shut down our companies and shut down our governments and shut down our educational institutions, we were able to migrate some of those over to the online space and at least keep the bridge going between where we were and today um, because of the fact that there were user-generated content services that allowed us to keep talking to each other. So I encourage everyone to really think about if you value that, make sure that we're thinking about how we can preserve that and consider how easy it is to take for granted, not only that we have it, but that the legal framework is helping us get it. Marianne? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think, uh, once again, I would want to ask the question of imagination. And the question about imagination, I mean, can we imagine a better world than the one we have now? Um, that is to say, uh, the world that we have now in which women, when they speak out, or whether they become famous for reasons that they had no control over, that their privacy will be violated, that their home addresses will be published, that they will be run out of their schools and out of their communities, um, when we think about the kinds of repercussions that happen when racial minorities speak out, um, the kinds of death threats that they will receive and the kinds of negative consequences they will have to suffer because of it, um, to think about how um, the spaces that really do control the way we communicate with each other and even decide what communication is, how they're optimized for um, essentially immediacy, impulsivity, and harm, um, how much that is rewarded as opposed to reflection and deliberation and expertise and how much all of that has cost all of us. Um, that the current moment we're living in is not despite of Section 230, it's because of it. Um, when things are going pretty badly right now, that isn't to say that there's some magical solution of getting rid of Section 230 or some other way in which everything works out perfectly. But the idea that we look around the world we have today and say, yep, this is as good as we could possibly do. This is as good as truth will ever get. This is as good as the marketplace of ideas will ever get. Um, corporations should continue to hoover up all the information and profits they want. 
and everybody should be less well informed and less able to communicate freely if they happen to be part of a vulnerable group, I'd say we, we should be dissatisfied with that. And the last thing I guess I would say then is really to move back to the notion of the Good Samaritan because it is actually instructive here to think about the parable that allegedly you know, inspired some of this um, reflection. And to keep in mind that the point of the Good Samaritan was you don't get to just walk past people, right? Um, and, and get an immunity from it. You're, you're perfectly welcome to walk past, um, but you're not actually going to get rewarded for that. And we're certainly not gonna reward you if you're one of the people who beat the, good, uh, who beat the person who's lying in the ditch to begin with. So if we're going to take some lessons from the Good Samaritan parable, it's that people do terrible things and lots of people let them do it. Um, and it's only the people who don't let them do it and who are not, in fact, benefiting from that terrible thing that deserve reward or immunity. And I'd say that's a pretty good uh, way to actually reconfigure or reorient some of the conversations that we're having about online behavior. Okay, so... I, I think that what I would just want to conclude with is, um, and again, having written a book about Section 230, it's good for book sales that Section 230 is in the news all the time, um, but it's not so good for my frustrations when I see uh, how the dialogue has been going. This dialogue has been great. Um, a lot of the dialogue in uh, the public sphere has not been so great. And what I really want hope that people ask when they're looking at, you know, Section 230 reform, stories about Section 230, the first question should be, is this a Section 230 problem? And a lot of what we talked about today uh, can possibly be addressed by changes to Section 230, changes to how it's interpreted. There's also some things that can't be addressed uh, by Section 230. So things like people are really upset about privacy violations by, uh, by big tech. And the I, I fully agree. I think we need a national privacy law. I, I think our current system is embarrassing in the United States, the fact that we lack it, but that's not Section 230. Uh, I, I think uh, there was a New York Times article last year that had across the entire business section, uh, something that said, this is the law, this is why hate speech is protected. And it was a picture of Section 230 that had to run a correction saying, no, it's actually the First Amendment. Uh, there are a lot, so, so we can address things, and I'm very, I, I think we should be looking at Section 230. I think, it's, I think any law this important needs to be looked at and see how to change it. But I also think that we need to keep in mind that eliminating 230, changing it, overhauling it, or doing nothing, whatever you do, that's not necessarily going to address all of the big technological problems. So again, that's why I'm really hoping that we have a deliberate look at, you know, when you change when you make these changes what are you actually going to do and will you actually address the harm that you're looking to prevent yeah thank you jeff that was a great wrap up everyone's wrap up was great um this conversation has been phenomenal i really hope that we get to i think it was a perfect foundation for kind of what I think will be the rest of the week, which is kind of, um, or the specifically the latter half of the week, which is going to really be about the politicization of 230, the limits of what 230 can answer. Um, but I think that we did a good job kind of discussing, I hope, like as uh, Marianne has pointed out and Eric has pointed out, the potential harms that uh, that 230 puts in place and the things that it doesn't do to, to to put to kind of allow these harms that per proliferate on the internet and how we want to address them. Um, thank you all for taking time out of your Monday to hang out with us for 90 minutes and not an hour. And um, I really uh, hope you come back and ask questions and participate. We'd love to have you um, at any point later in the week kind of uh, come in and ask a question or, or um, or uh, weigh in on some of the things that people uh, grow out of this conversation. So thank you so much for coming. And thank, thank you. you all for watching. Thank you. Bye.